Hello everyone, welcome to part two of four with Veracio. And we're filming this one from iMark 2023 in, in Sydney, Australia. We're doing a lot of episodes in Australia because they have great technology, some of the best guests we've ever had, and um, and Gaudi gets to travel all over Australia. I, I think she, I think she, I hope she's enjoying herself. But this is part two of a uh, part two of a four part series, and we have Michael Anderson, uh, Arthurson. Sorry, Michael. Michael, welcome to the show. Great to have you on Mining Now. Thank you very much. I'm psyched to be here. Um, it's the. The, the, we're going to come at it from all angles. So let's start with your let's start with your background to sort of give you some co- uh, the audience some context and then set up the rest of the interview. Yep, um, I'll have to reverse the tape about fourteen years. That's about how long I've spent in the industry thus far. Um, I have mechanical engineering background. Um, I've been very much into product development and you know designing products and and, and those kind of things from from uni training. Um, but in addition to that, I've also always had a strong mind and and an interest in business. So I've I've also got a innovation and entrepreneurship um, master as well. Um, so that's sort of sort of my background. Um, Fourteen years ago. So when you got into the industry, what was your primary what was your primary focus or role? Well, that's an interesting one and a quite long story too. But I guess uh, I guess that's a very vital part of it. So the the way I got into this, and I, I wasn't alone. Um, I was doing this. The start of Minalize, as we know it, is actually a master thesis project from university, really? and it was myself and my colleague Anneli Lundstrom. Uh, the two of us were merely students at the time. Uh, we didn't. We didn't know each other very well. We've been doing a few different tasks together in school. Uh, this was at Sharmer School of Entrepreneurship in Gothenburg. So it's an entrepreneurship school uh, where they basically take engineers of different trades, uh, students then, uh, and and uh, bring in the business aspects and, and trying to get the entrepreneurial um, addition to that. So having said that, it's a quite competitive type program. Mm. It's full on a lot of tasks, uh, very short time frames that you have to solve. And me and Anley had the uh, had the opportunity to do a few of these tasks together over the couple of years there of master. And as we got close to our master thesis uh, sort of selection process, uh, we decided that we, we wanted to try to work together because from the school's point of view, you actually could could decide whether you like to um, whether you would prefer to choose your project or would if you would prefer to choose your your partner to work with and me and Anley were like yep let's let's partner up uh, whatever the task is and and let's take it from there uh, lucky though we actually got one of the tasks that both of us actually wanted to to do as well uh, together with working together we also got the task that both of us uh, really were interested in and that was I mean, the way this works uh, is that you essentially get presented with a few different ideas or problems from industry or from university, and you essentially get offered a desk and a phone and and a little bit of capital from the school, oh. and that's uh, where you start. Um, so me and Anley, we got this problem, uh, I would say, because it wasn't a solution at the time, from a drilling company in Sweden um, that essentially were waiting with the rigs in the field because uh, the geologists couldn't point out where to drill next because they were waiting for assays from the lab. Mm. So that's essentially the lead-in uh, for me and Anley. Uh, we essentially were handed this problem and and now we were about to then solve that problem and also make this a business, a viable business. So that was really the journey from 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 get go. Let's talk about our heavy industry tour brought to you by Savannah Equipment, supplying mining equipment worldwide, and Geograph, solving customer challenges through innovation and design, higher performing parts, engineered solutions, on-time spare part supply, and high quality repairs. We are heading to events across North America and Australia and filming episodes on location. Email us at info at to be part of Crownsman's heavy industry world tour. 
Bentec Group is an industry leader when it comes to design, engineering, and manufacturing. Bentec specializes in engineered safety and efficiency equipment such as access platforms, heavy-duty workbenches, work stands and trestles, material and equipment storage, and a range of lifting and handling solutions to maximize safety for your personnel. But that's not their only area of expertise. Bentec also supply high-performance OEM replacement parts for mobile equipment. Bentec's rocks mining parts are built better, eliminating downtime and maximizing efficiency. Visit bentechgroup.com.au today to explore their range. Revolutionize your mining operations with MassPro's engineering excellence. Their engineering talent can transform your mining machinery, supercharge your productivity, and improve your equipment optimization. Your success is their mission, and they're prepared to take your mining operations to new heights by maximizing efficiency, safety, and ore extraction like never before. Head to masspro.com.au for further information. Um, wow. That's, that, yeah. Uh, so how do you go from, so this is a, this is a thesis, right? And then, yep. And how do you then take it? <laughs> that that's a it's a big leap <laughs> to taking it to it and turn it into a startup. How did that happen? Yeah, so that's essentially the goal of this education. That after the education, the idea is then that you have enough, you know, information at hand and and confidence in your idea to actually embark on the entrepreneurship. So the trail school is really than- pushing for you to actually try to make this a viable business. That's exactly right. Wow. I mean, that's the, the outcome. So, uh, you know, that's what that's what the school wants, right? And that's what all the stakeholders want is for these ideas to turn into viable businesses. So I, I, that's I, really the leading. Yeah. yeah, I have to ask, this, this school, I, is this uh, is this a government funded school? Is it private? How, how do they how do they do this? No, it's just the, the regular university in, in oh. Sweden, in Gothenburg, uh, but with this entrepreneurship program. And I, I believe there are a few of these kind around the world, uh, but mm-hmm. this is probably one of the ones that uh, with with the ecosystem in Sweden that, that have obviously had some success, I would say, in, in, in this space and are pretty unique in that way. Yeah. Wow. I, I would love to talk to them someday. That sounds very interesting. Um, but um, how do you then... I can't imagine it's an exorbitant amount of money that you've got to get a startup. So how do you then take it to, you know, you're, and we're going to get into the technology here in a little bit, but how yeah. do you then fund like prototypes and, <laughs> you know, well, take it to market? That is a big question. Yep. Yep. And uh, we all have grand ideas and, and everyone who's embarking on these entrepreneurship, uh, you know, projects, they have great ideas. Uh, but yes, finding the funding and sometimes don't get me wrong, but sometimes I wish I made something more simple than building full blown x-ray systems for the mining (laughs) industry because they are not cheap. I'll tell you that much. No, I Uh, I guess that, but, but, uh, no, it, it all, you all have to, you know, you have to take step by step. So when we started, obviously, uh, both our peers, families, friends, uh, and investors or potential investors were all doubting. Well, these two students, however grand the idea is mm-hmm. of, of revolutionizing the mining industry, will they actually be able to pull it off, right? I mean, that's that's a, a fair question. But yeah, I mean, first you build a prototype. So we did find some government funding to to get the first, you know, prototype together. Um, and and you know, a, a simple, a simplified minimum viable type pro- pro- product. And in our case. It was a machine that could scan half a meter of sample um, at a time and you load it manually and all of that. But but it sort of proved that the core technology in this uh, all all seemed to work fine and we could generate those results. And at that point, when we were doing our master thesis, we were essentially tapping in on some other master thesis programs to have master thesis students do master mm. theses for us. I mean, that's that's a, mm. also a little bit twisted in its way, but it's um, it, it, it sort of uh, worked well. And, and we actually could engage students uh, for, for a couple of years to to help us confirm and, and make that that base concept, um, which was which was really, really good because we learned a lot. A lot of people involved learned a lot. What we had to do as a core, me and Anley, was essentially go out there and and, and realize what what is needed. Where's the gap in this market? What what can be done? Uh, but as part of this process, we did engage quite a lot of students uh, who were also in master programs and other things and in different disciplines around school. And they they actually contributed to to the, the product concept uh, in, in different ways, which was quite interesting in itself. But really as well, uh, we had to do the groundwork uh, properly. So me and Anley, we, we went out into the field. 
uh, we were chatting up these different geologists and drilling companies and try to understand, as we said, and what is the gap in the market. Um, and we did realize three things, and I think we'll come back to them later. So the the thing we, in the process today, right, you, you sort of, um, when you drill for exploration work, extract that core or RC chips, but in our case in Sweden, it was mainly core samples mm -hmm. out of the ground, right? Uh, cylindrical rods, essentially, of, of geological material. And you essentially then put that into core trays, a tray that holds these samples, and then a geologist uh, overlooks this and, and then decides what type of rock that is and and what should be sampled in a lab, right? And, and things like that. And after that, they've been sent to the lab, they cut it up and, and crush it and, and analyze it. Um, the, the main problem here was essentially the, the turnaround time. Mm. At the time, back in 2009, it was booming days, but yet some of the rigs were standing still because of the of this turnaround time lag, which was at the time about six to, to eight weeks. Um, so what we, what we saw there is that, yep, you have that turnaround uh, lag. Uh, that was one thing. The other thing is essentially, if you're picky with what you analyze, you will essentially pick uh, samples here and there, but you wouldn't analyze the whole the whole run of, of core. So uh, what 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 that then became is a little bit of a Swiss cheese down down you know in in the ground. You you have information about bits, but you also don't have about other bits. Uh, so we saw that as a as a problem too, and and the third problem. Uh, is associated with the fact that there is a person who, I mean, the whole process is quite uh, dependent on a person making a judgment on what the rock is. So that becomes quite subjective oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So we wanted a more objective view on, on what, what actually came out of the ground. So those are the three main problems that we decided to attack uh, and where we saw a gap in the, in the market at the time. Um, and at this time, there was technologies around that uh, that could analyze samples non-destructively, actually in the hand of a or in the form of a handheld device that you can point and shoot um, based on XRF um, technology, which is X-ray fluorescence, um, quite well known in the industry at the time. It was just making its way, um, but we then sort of had that as input data to us. Like this is this is where we are today. And, and this is where the gap is in the market with the problems that we could identify at the time. Hey, mining enthusiasts. Registration for CIM Connect 2024 Vancouver from May 12th to 15th is now open. Last year, this convention had over 6,800 participants from 60 countries with 1,796 delegates, 702 booths, and 320 presentations. Secure your spot and register now at convention.cim.org. CIM Connect 2024, where quality and innovation define the experience. Orica Digital Solutions seamlessly connects customers' physical and digital worlds so they can readily understand and optimize operations at every step of the value chain, from exploration to processing. Whether deployed individually or as a whole, Orica Digital Solutions technologies deliver intelligence for open cut and underground mines to make more precise and faster decisions. With a complete, timely, and accurate picture, operations can adapt to improve safety, drive productivity, reduce costs, and environmental impacts. To learn more about Orica Digital Solutions, visit orica.com forward slash digital solutions today. Michael, I want to go to, um, I want to jump to when you go to market. Um, we're going to, we're also going to get into the acquisition by Veracio and, and talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, but before yep. we do that, so then, so a after you, you've done prototypes and testing and raised some money and I'm, I'm sure stretched yourself and, and done all the things that it takes to start off, then you actually took it to market. People started using this. Yes, that, that's right. And that was very exciting, um, scary as well, but very exciting. Um, and luckily, we did find clients around Sweden um, that, that wanted to try this, this out. Um, we did need to convince industry still, though, um, because of, of you know, the, the speed at which we had actually developed this solution was actually fairly rapid. So from being a student one day to then have a solution the next, um, obviously required a little bit of, of convincing. Uh, but yeah, the best, the best way was to get out there. Um, we got uh, the first client we had was a Swedish mining company. Uh, they sent some core down to, to Gothenburg, where we were then based. Uh, we started scanning that and 
And on the MVP that we had built, we managed to scan, you know, thousands and thousands of meters. And actually one client in Sweden, they, they've actually got a little bit dependent on the system. Like we've, we've, they've had several targets. Uh, they had a lot of consultants working several of those targets, but there was one target where, uh, where they had a bit of a gap. So they actually ended up sending quite a lot of meters to us, more than we could have ever have hoped for, which was very, very useful. Um, that at that point in time, and I still can remember those days, those were the first days where complete drilling projects were then mapped by centimeter resolution, XRF data. And, and it was just amazing to see be some of the first in the world to see this type of data at, at this scale. Um, still remember it to the day. It yeah. must have been just an unbelievable feeling to to accomplish y- that. Yes. And, and what I think was, was great in this is that, first of all, yes, the machine worked. Uh, the MVP worked, which was great. Uh, but it also projected a lot of trajectories for us. Like, mm. okay, we could do this, but then what else can we do? Right. And it started to clarify where you could go with it, your scalability, your core customers, things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we had to bring it then. At that point, we had to bring it from the MVP, which is a sort of a dumbed-down version, just to convince ourselves, investors, everyone around, including clients, that this can work into the actual real product, which is a more highly automated uh, system that, you know, that, that does things faster, uh, more type of data coming out. And that's where we had to venture into, you know, the technology space to try to realize how can we automate this. And that's really, you know, we heard several times that, you know, building machines like we wanted to do would be fantastic, um, but also yet impossible. Mm. Uh, getting an XRF sensor to follow a core at a millimeter precision as a core sample varies in height and all of that, we need to actually capture that with a millimeter, submillimeter precision. Um, that's where we got our heads together. And in, in the concept, we introduced something that was very new to the industry at that time. And that was using a LIDAR system. And that's essentially a laser that maps the topography or the surface of the sample. And so we did that in, in a way to, to be sure that we could scan the sample with an XRF sensor. So the two technology, uh, the, the laser is telling the XRF that this is where, so they're, they're actually talking, essentially talking to each other. Okay. Exactly right. Exactly right. And and that's where we found our our initial IP, our patents. You know that wow. all grew from there, from that discovery itself. So that's essentially what changed this from being impossible to being possible. Um, and I mean, the the reference to that is just looking at from from a Gothenburg perspective in Sweden, the where they where they pr- produce the Volvo cars. Uh, it could be other cars produced as well. But, you know, seeing how they manage weld seams in that factory on, on these curved surfaces uh, using these type of systems, we, we realized, you know, the impossible shouldn't be that that impossible, really. Right. So I guess an important takeaway for us here, I think, is stepping into this mining industry uh, with, a, with an engineering perspective rather than a geology, maybe, mm-hmm. perspective as such, uh, probably enabled us to see solutions in ways that that others might struggle uh, at right. the time um and i think that sort of possibly led into these quiet novel ideas mm-hmm. um around how to go about this specific problem uh, um what oh sorry what go was ahead. very ex- yeah so what was very exciting with that though is that that base technology of a lidar mapping a sample for the purposes of xrf scanning we realized that that enables so much more we could see how this technology just was a foundation of other spin-off data sets. And, and that was, was very important to us, was to be very close to the client. So when we did all the testing and all of that, we, we were literally spending time with the client, at the client, to understand what else do you do with your samples? Like, yeah, we measure them as well. And we, you know, we also measure the density of them and, and we do structural logging and a few different things. And we could immediately project how how the this lidar laser based topographic data set could actually be used to solve other problems as well and that was not on the initial chart but there it was that's so, so interesting i'm glad you you kind of took the time to explain that because that i was actually missing that i watched a video of the scanning and like the the core was broken and i was like oh okay but i couldn't quite piece it together but now i know with the lidar because yeah. we've done a lot of episodes about yeah. specifically about lidar so 
Um, yeah. And then uh, I, I will say, you just love this, don't you? You, you, you you're smiling as you're talking. There, there's a pretty yeah. consistent smile. You just love doing this. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. No. Uh, definitely. The whole, the whole, uh, the whole thing. Not every day. Not every but, day. No. Uh, most of the day, the, 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 the good overweighs the bad for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the, the. It's sort of the undertone of this show as well. Is that, is, is, is the entrepreneurial spirit what people actually go through and what always stands out is how much time it actually takes that always stands out to me that there is just i mean for us our company's eight years in now and we're just getting started you just just if you could if if i could take any if i give anybody advice is take the time listen to your customers push the technology as far as you possibly can without breaking your brain and and take your time and you got to do all that at the same time. Um, and exactly then, right. And I could also mention the first initial business plan we had, we would have realized all of this uh, in two years' time. That right. obviously was not the case. <laughs> no, it, I don't, it never is. Um, but um, And then you, let's jump forward to because then Veracio comes into the picture and uh, – and we had uh, Michael Ravella, Ravel, I don't know why, Ravella, sorry, Michael. Michael Ravella, and he gave a great interview. Um, and he was talking a little bit about the acquisition and the merging of the culture, like the, every step of the way, it just went through so, it just went so well. Can you talk about yeah. it from your experience? Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've known Mike for, for many, many years. We've, we've been, I've been seeing him at trade shows and all of that. And then uh, Verasio came about and, and this merger happened and um, it's, uh, or merger, acquisition, acquisition actually. Um, but yeah, what I, what I find is, uh, is that the, it, it's going really well. I think we, we all think quite similarly about the possibilities in the industry. We obviously have had to, uh, to, to battle the same challenges in terms of convincing the industry in, in teaching the industry, uh, in showing the industry the way of of how these core scanning type equipments uh, can and should be be used, um, and also try to project what the future uh, have in mind. So I think we think very similarly there, and I think both of our uh, teams uh, prior have have really had similar challenges. So we could all relate to, to to these possibilities and opportunities, if that makes sense. Yeah, is it is it the key for I? I... I, I don't know. I don't want to create a false equivalency, but I'll give it a shot. I remember years ago, um, and I've referenced him many times on the show. He's since passed away, um, but he was one of the first people to um, to kind of give me time when I was at. I was first coming to mining events. I felt very out of place and um, trying to pretend I'm a professional. Obviously, I look like a kid. And but he took time. We ended up meeting for breakfast one day, and he was just he was just wonderful. And I remember him talking about specifically about like companies sharing, like mining operators sharing assets and just more collaboration was needed in the industry to really make it what it needed to be. This type of yeah. thing, Veracio and 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 your company, uh, Mentalize, sorry, uh, coming together um, mm. and, and putting the technology together, putting the brain power together. How much does that drive the innovation? Does that drive the advancement, uh, drive the adoption of the industry, of new technology that's coming in? Certainly, I would say so. And what I find very fortunate, now I said we battle the same type problems and the same, you know, but but we do battle them in different ways. And that's Mm. what I found very, very interesting here is that um, some of the solutions, we've all focused on on actually different parts of the solution, more so. So what I find really, really great is that uh, some of the stuff that Veracio really have spent time developing it has yeah. is essentially slightly different to the areas where we have spent time innovating. So us coming together this way means that we now have a more complete package, mm. uh, really already on the on the onset now, which is awesome. But also we have a lot of enablers uh, within our organizations for uh, like what I saw with. With, you know with the lidar in the past and, and how that then spun out to be different offerings and, and solutions to other problems I can now see how we can multiply those type of, of situations uh, having standing where we are now as a joint joint force so you talked about some of the manage of uh, the advantages now with Veracio and and we've talked about it on the other episode 
I want to just walk through for the audience some of the, the core technology that we just, I don't want to miss it. There, there's a the cloud technology, the software, the gathering data, the you've got a Minilogger, the core scanner. I'm reading off a list here. And there's, I know it's a lot. We don't have an hour to go through every single one. But can you yeah. sort of walk the audience through what they're getting into with this technology? Uh, no, and, and uh, I, I get it. it. It's a lot of things. And it's more than I ever thought it had to be, to be honest. Um, I thought, like on the onset, what I thought we'd do is we try to recreate the data sets that they're already getting, the clients already getting from wherever source they're getting it. So, for example, a, a laboratory assay from a laboratory, generally what, what comes out of that is an Excel sheet uh, with a depth uh, or a sample number and a different composition, right? And that is what we tried to replicate because we, we knew that that's what the industry knows what it is. You know, they, they, they're used to this. So I thought it was always enough to just provide that. But little did I know that that was very much not enough because then when people started to see what the technology was capable of, and it's a quite complex data set, high resolution imaging is one part of it, the LIDAR images, the XRF data, um, it was so much more than an what you can fit into an Excel sheet, if you, if you get what I mean. Uh, so what we needed to do, and this was upon client request, and we could see that ourselves too, we need a platform to view this, to properly give this technology and the data sets, uh, you know, a, a visualization space it deserves. So that's where we came up with this software Minalogger. Um, and what, what that essentially is, it's a software package that that sort of combines all these data sets into one place. So you have, you, you have sort of that 3D model, and on that 3D model, we draped the high-resolution image to colorize that model so that you essentially see a, um, a, a colored 3D version of your, of your drill core right there on your screen. Uh, on top of this, uh, you could also overlay the chemistry on, say, a centimeter interval, um, uh, and and that plots up as bar graphs just along that core in a way that's never been visualized before. And on top of all of this, obviously, 14 years, if you reverse back, there was no such thing as a cloud. You know, people didn't know what, you know, that, that might have been a buzzword at the time, but people didn't really know what it was. So over the time, we had to pivot as well in terms of, you know, what, what the capabilities were. So what we did as well is that software that then, um, you know, showcased all this data, we managed to also get that all done in a web browser, which means that it essentially could be hosted on the cloud natively, accessed through the web browser, which means that you could actually access this data almost wherever you were on the, on, on, in the world, uh, as long as you had connectivity. Um, so. It's it's really a a step change there as well, and we spent a lot of time developing that part. And I think that's another side where Minalize have been quite unique. I think you can ask clients around. And I think they will come back to the fact that that software is quite unique, apart from the scanning system itself. That that's a unique piece. So I think I think those two things together sort of touch upon uh, sort of touches upon the the software and the cloud in in one go. Um, if that makes sense. So, Michael, I don't. As we kind of wrap up the interview, I don't want to go too far out into the future, and that that is just for for what I've learned. It, it doesn't always make great interviews because it's it's the, it becomes theoretical a little bit. Um, but yep. where today today where is sort of the innovation taking place? What are you looking at? What the, what technology are you sort of perfecting and merging with Veracio and, and all that? Can you kind of round that out for us uh, to close off the interview? Yeah. No. Sure. Uh, would love to. And if you ask me personally, I feel that that really has had a lot of buzzwords in the past five years in this industry is essentially uh, the word machine learning. And I think what these instruments, uh, the hardware itself, the scanners and all these sensors are actually acquiring is the perfect base for machine learning. And if you talk about machine learning, which is a very, very broad word in this uh, context, like one of, the, one of the, the problems, and I want to lead back to that, one of those three identified problems we had in the start was the subjectivity, right, uh, of, of deciding what type of rock it is, what should be assayed and for what reason. I would like to see there, I mean, digital logging is, is a word here where, you know, logging is the process of a geologist deciding what it is and identifying what it is. 
now we want to introduce this digital way of doing that. And, and the Minalogger is one way of doing that as a start. But where I see the future going is essentially really applying this machine learning uh, context to, to do that. And I know there are different groups out there who's doing this. Um, the idea in, in itself is not novel. But what I think is important here is that with the access to the data, the way we do all the raw data, all the resolution we got, we have a really good possibility here to, to really develop that, that aspect of, of the industry and revolutionize that next. And I've already seen um, a lot of test work we've done uh, pointing to this really being a viable um, leading to, to what the future brings. It's it's very exciting, um, and and I really mean that. It's you know you you do these episodes, and I, I, I said the same thing to Michael is that, um, your booth, Gaudi's having to like chase people out, and that you know when trade shows don't always. If you have a thousand companies there, not everyone is busy. It's just one of yep. it's the nature of them. But there's always a few, and uh, it looks yep. like you've got the one that a lot of people are wanting to come through. So that's great to see. Um, I want to yeah, leave you with a very yeah. entrepreneurial question. Um, just what, very simple one. Um, you can take a moment to think about it. But out of all the times, what is the lesson that you learned over 14 years? You've you've been through, you just started with a thesis, then you put money together, and then you brought it to yeah. market, then you, you know, how there was an acquisition. You, you're putting all this together. What's a lesson you know, these things, you know, you, as you're driving, you think back, you, you think back to a moment that really pivoted you, maybe even in your life, maybe before all this started. Is there something that stands out that sort of set the tone for being able to go through all of this? Yes. Uh, take the step, uh, because otherwise you would regret you never tried. Um, so don't be afraid of taking that step and try. Um, it, it did seem crazy and it was crazy. But at the same time, very rewarding, I would say, this whole journey of 14 years in this industry, shaping this product, definitely worth taking that test, that step we took at the time. Um, and I can't stress that enough. Uh, I know it's a hard one. It's going outside of your uh, comfort zone. But, you know, I think it's, you need to really take, take that step. Uh, otherwise, it, it won't happen by itself. That much is clear. Michael, we will leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this, I I love when we get to do these these multi episodes with a company because you get to pull back the layers and really get to know who they are. Our audience, you see consistently more and more views on each episode quite often because the audience really gets to know and gets invested in it. So thank you very much and, and just being engaged. And, and I can tell you enjoy it, which just makes it that much more fun for me as an interviewer. So thank you for coming on. And, and I really do hope we get to do it again. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, love to be here. And uh, yeah, uh, hope to see you around more. Thank you. And I uh, hope have a, a great rest of the show. And thank you, everybody, for watching. I hope you enjoyed that episode. We've got plenty more coming to you. Um, go check. There'll be lots of links um, to all the, the episodes you're seeing. And we're going to have Horacio on, uh, Minalize. We're go they're all going to be links to the different episodes that we've done with them. Um, so please check those out. Please subscribe. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next episode of Mining Now.